a special presentation of LOBF with archaeologists Dr. Lawrence Garrity and Dr. Doug Clark, Excavating the Bible. No, sorry, I, didn't, I did not even, sorry, let me start that over, sorry. <laughs> I did not even see that. Do we catch you speechless? You know, you, <laughs> no, I actually was ready to go, but I just didn't time it. You caught me out of time. That's what it was, so. Sorry about that. I didn't think we'd catch you speechless. Well, you, you could, you could. That was, that was interesting. That was a, that was a, a blank right there. I start with the blooper, end with the blooper. <laughs> A special presentation of LOBF with archaeologists Dr. Lawrence Garrity and Dr. Doug Clark, Excavating the Bible. Welcome to this edition of Excavating the Bible, What Archaeology Can Teach Us. This program is dedicated to exploring the contributions of Middle Eastern archaeology to our understanding of and appreciation for the Bible. I'm Doug Clark, director of the Center for Near Eastern Archaeology at La Sierra University in Riverside, California. And to help us talk about the time of Jesus, the life and times of Jesus, we have two guests, both Vincent's, Matt, and his wife, Monique, both of you doctoral students in archaeology, anthropology, they go hand in hand. Where are you studying, Matt, and what is your focus? I'm at the University of California, San Diego, where I'm an anthropology student, but I'm mixing a lot of technology. Technology, our techno go-to person. Mm -hmm. So, And Monique, you're studying where? I am studying at the University of Chicago, um, studying Near Eastern art and archaeology, specifically of this region of Syria, Palestine. Right. And, and time frames, I mean, you're focusing on what we call the early Iron Age. So the, mm -hmm. the early time of, well, we talk about Joshua Judges from then on. Um, any particular time frame you're looking at? I mean, I, I like to consider myself all inclusive. Okay. I love the Iron Age period, but um, the biblical periods are very interesting. To right. Me. Old Testament and New Testament. Correct. Now, both of you are um, teaching a class, team teaching a class uh, it, that we call Jesus and the Gospels at La Sierra University. Um, we asked you to teach this class and to bring into this class, it's an introductory class to the ministry of Jesus, we asked you to think archaeologically and bring that in as a special dimension. What has that been like uh, in, in teaching about something very familiar? Um, we're all familiar with the, with the Gospels. We go there first when we want to read the Bible through. Um, what have you learned in putting together the biblical and the archaeological? I, I think I'm getting more out of it than the students are. Uh, you know, really getting into a lot of this material. I've had classes that lead up and kind of deal with the Second Temple period, but when I'm now thinking about it both from an archaeological and theological standpoint, it's coming alive for me. I'm really enjoying it. Monique? Um, for me, it's just realizing how much of Jesus' world, especially among the peasant farmers of Roman Palestine, um, how much of his imagery he borrows from that, um, from the farming, from the fishing, um, from, from people who, who have to find their jobs on a daily basis because they're now landless. Um, so the rich imagery that he borrows from this world in order to, to teach about his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, to teach about this cosmic realm, but he uses very down-to-earth language to do that. There is a particular methodology in, in reading the Bible, at least in modern scholarship, uh, that we call exegesis. It's drawing meaning out. And the three questions typically asked are, what did these words mean to the people who first heard them? Mm -hmm. And then, what then do they mean to us? And then, at least in my way of thinking about it, so what? I mean. How does that change me? How does that affect me? Those are the questions I ask. Archaeology helps answer that first one. Mm -hmm. Now, is it important? I mean, I think a lot of people would say it's just not all that important to know what people looked like, what they dressed like, how they worshipped, um, and it's not all important. Why is it that you decided to put, besides the fact that we asked you, <laughs> um, to put archaeology into this class? Why do you think that's important? 
I mean, in a way you've expressed it, but what would you add to that in terms of you know, bringing it to life or maybe giving us a sense of the real people Jesus talked to uh, or maybe even the real Jesus? Um, what would you say? We have 2,000 years of theological interpretation on top of the gospel and we carry that baggage with us. Mm -hmm. And I feel like archaeology can help remove a lot of those layers and kind of bring us back to maybe the original intended ideas behind Jesus' message, his audience. Um, and it, it really does bring us back to a deeper understanding of, of what was going on, trying to remove our Western interpretation, our own ideologies from it, and maybe get back to the original message, which I often find much more oh, inspiring. Extremely refreshing, I think, yeah. in many ways. Especially if you've been raised with the stories, and you yeah. think, I can't learn anything more here. But as a matter of fact, turning a page, if I can use that metaphor, mm -hmm. in, into archaeology, and, and maybe turning a layer of soil over, um, opens that world up in ways that are, that are extremely helpful. Um, one of my favorite passages that um, kind of cements my commitment to do this, to find out what, it, what these words really meant to the uh, first people who heard them, is in a small book that in the Adventist tradition is special, uh, written by Ellen White, a small book called Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, which is Jesus stuff, it's, it's Jesus' story, um, and the Sermon on the Mount, recorded in the first part of the Gospel of Matthew. And I've always found this short paragraph uh, extremely helpful. She says, let us in imagination go back to that scene. So she's recreating the scene of the sermon on the mountain uh, near the Sea of Galilee. So let us in imagination go back to that scene. And as we sit with the disciples on the mountainside, enter into the thoughts and feelings that filled their hearts. Not mine at this point, but their hearts. How can I reconstruct that? Well, maybe archeology span can help us do that. And then she goes on and says, Understanding what the words of Jesus meant to those who heard them, we may discern in them a new vividness and beauty and may also gather for ourselves their deeper lessons. So there's both, and I think archaeology can help us here, there's both an aesthetic dimension, we can see something more beautiful, um, but also deeper lessons. So something aesthetic and something academic. Uh, and it seems to me, and I hear you saying the same thing. It was so nice to have you as students. You taught me a lot, too. Um, <laughs> that archaeology may actually help us do that. And in the process, we can appreciate scripture more as well as understand it better. Absolutely. So what can we know about archaeology and the time of Jesus and the life of Jesus? And a lot of scholars now refer to Jesus as Jesus of Nazareth. Um, and on this map that we have, uh, tell us about this map, um, north to south, in territory that Jesus would have crossed. Of course, we see the uh, big body of water up there. Doug, if you'd point that out for us, is Jesus' home, the Sea yes. of Galilee, right over there. Um, the vast majority of Jesus' ministry, according to the Synoptic Gospels, happened there. It's really only the last week of his life that he moves down right. to Jerusalem. And the Synoptic Gospels would be? Uh, Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke. And Luke, yeah. Yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, of course, that's all happening there. As we move further to the south, we think about uh, Samaria, the former yes. northern kingdom. Uh, and, you know, of course, we think about the Samaritan coming from here, uh, certain ideologies of the time where they're looking at the Samaritans as being uh, rejected because of this mixed heritage mm -hmm. until we finally get down to Judea um, and Jerusalem. And Jerusalem down here. Correct. So, yeah. And um, we do have some activity recorded of Jesus on the other side of the Jordan. Yeah. Uh, what was known in um, New Testament times as Perea. It's not labeled here, but mm -hmm. Perea. Um, and Jesus often walked between north and south. I don't know how many times he did this in the course of his life, but when he did, he often would go across the river. Now, why would that be? I mean, this looks like a fairly straight shot from Jerusalem up to the Sea of Galilee. This is where the stories, Peter, the fishermen, the, the disciples, and so on. So why wouldn't Jesus go straight through here? It's a difficult land, dangerous land, a lot of different things happening. And you've got some uh, 
I'm, I'm not going to say, well, maybe I could say tribal, mm -hmm. um, but certainly with the Samaritans. In the, in the uh, non-synoptic gospel, in the Gospel of John, you have the story of the woman at the well. Yeah. And do Samaritans and Jews get along? No, yeah. the answer is a very, uh, fairly significant yeah. one. In fact, there's an interesting source um, by Joachim uh, Jeremias, Jeremias um, Jerusalem, um, Jerusalem in the time of Jesus, and he studies um, rabbinic texts and, and uh, other texts from the time. And it is extremely interesting. Anywhere a Samaritan woman would spit became ritually unclean so Jews couldn't walk by there. <laughs> so when you get to that level of ritual uncleanness, um, it's, it may be better <laughs> to go around uh, and to come up this way. Okay, so what kinds of things can we learn uh, about, uh, or from archaeology, about Jesus and his times? We have to rewind several hundred years. I mean, we have this big gap in the Bible that really ends with the, the exile and, you know, briefly coming back, rebuilding. But there's this gap of several hundred years where we don't really get a, a picture of what's going on. And, of course, by the time Jesus shows up on the scene, ideologies have shifted, culture is different, and a lot of this comes out of uh, the, the post-exile movements, the diaspora, as we can call it. Uh, if we look at, at cities like Alexandria, where you have very strong uh, Jewish communities, it's at this time, of course, that the idea mm -hmm. of the word Jew first shows up. Mm -hmm. um, before this, they would have been Israelites or Reubenites or Gadites. But uh, by this time, we now have Jews. All this tribal identity has been absorbed into one idea. But it's a time that's, that's um, just wrought with all kinds of strife. Uh, I mean, you think about... Um, Jerusalem at this time is split between empires. Alexander comes through, he established his, his empire, he dies, his general split it up, and Jerusalem's practically caught in the middle of those empires, sitting on the periphery. So you have, in one way, these Hellenistic ideas, philosophy forming, you have Jewish um, uh, in, intents to try to become part of the Hellenistic world, of course, the uh, Septuagint is translated uh, from the Hebrew into Greek right, the Greek at this Old time. Testament, right? Correct, yeah, right. The, the Greek Old Testament, which really uh, gives us an idea that at this point in time, the Jewish community is speaking Greek, not Hebrew. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a shift in I I ideologies now where we're away from the temple, and now we're into a, a synagogue mode, where in all these diaspora cities, people are now gathering in, in community centers. They may have started in households, but they form into becoming community centers where there are houses of prayer, but there are also ways to maintain a Jewish identity when they were outside and away from Jerusalem. So all of these things are starting to happen. And it's this struggle to maintain Jewish identity in these hundreds of years before Jesus that really sets the scene for when Jesus comes on there and we see these political struggles from the Romans, from the Sadducees, the Pharisees, who were really two political parties mm -hmm. who were you know, rival factions trying to maintain a political control of the Jewish world. And that's a big part of the background. So, so it may be that really to understand the life and times of Jesus or life and teachings of Jesus or Jesus and the Gospels, it's really it, it puts one on vantage ground if you've done some background reading. Uh, yeah. From this time, what we would call between the Testaments, yeah. uh, Hellenistic or Greek, and then into Roman times, so that the developing theologies, they're not all tied directly to the Old Testament. Right. See, we kind of make the leap from Old Testament to New Testament and forget there are several hundred years, as you mentioned, yeah. of history and development. And, and what we're talking about now is adding archaeology to the mix and creating this scene so that we can, as the paragraph uh, indicates that I read, in our imaginations go back and try to enter into the thoughts of people listening to Jesus. And all of a sudden, we appreciate it more and we understand it better, those, those, both of those dimensions. A beautiful picture, a beautiful painting, uh, shows up in publications uh, on uh, archaeology of the time of Jesus in the early Roman period. Tell us about this picture. Well, a couple of things. Um, this really sets the stage for Jesus' early life. Um, this is the kind of village that he grew up in, and Nazareth was pretty small, um, about 400 people. When you think about that size of a village, everybody is related in some way. <laughs> Um, everybody knows who you are from the moment that you're born. 
Um, and so for the first 30 years of his life, this is the small kind of village that he lived in, working um, with the wood, working with different people. And is it any wonder that when he tries to come back and do miracles, um, Mark records that he could do no powerful act there. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to, to, to see somebody who grew up you know, in their diapers and, and running around, um, to see them as a prophet, to see them as someone special. They're just that kid from the house next door. Wow. So it's, it's interesting to think about the size of, of Nazareth um, for this response that we see um, to him trying to come back and work miracles in his own town. And um, so this indicates a different town than Nazareth because this was on the Sea of Galilee. So where is this one? This one is in Capernaum. Um, so a, a slightly smaller village nearby Nazareth um, where Jesus would have also been familiar. Mm -hmm. Actually, quite a bit below sea level, though. I mean, the Sea of Galilee is about 600 feet below sea level. Nazareth is up uh, in the hills. Uh, you've already crossed the sea level, level uh, line, and you've gone up. Uh, so a different kind of location. But this is the place where we think about most of the life of Jesus. Is that right? Would I be correct in saying mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. Most of his ministry right. is, is taking place in villages like this. Right. And it's such a great illustration. If we had time, we could look at some of the details, including the little cat over on the right-hand side guarding the drying fish. I'm not sure if that was uh, an intentional sort of reminder by the artist. Uh, pay attention here. There might be some surprises, uh, but in any case. So a mosaic, what is this about? This is just a contemporary mosaic illustrating daily village life. People heading off to a festival, riding their donkey, carrying their produce with them. So people, sure. people in a relaxed state. Right. Um, so just a nice illustration of how they saw themselves um, in this period. And carrying these baskets full of food, a nice uh, illustration of how it was done. Do you know where this comes from? Do not. Is, uh, I'm wondering if this isn't from somewhere around the gallery, but I don't know I think that. so. I think so. Right. I think it's supposed, to, it's supposed to be illustrating these people. Right, right. Okay, what do we have in this? This is getting closer to what archaeologists are used to looking at, these, <laughs> these, topo, these topo plans or these yeah. architectural drawings. Um, tell us about this. What do we have going on in this drawing? All right, well, we have two excellent archaeological illustrations from the life and, uh, and the ministry of Jesus. Um, and this particular one is called Peter's House. Um, so if you could point out, there's a Byzantine church found octagonal um, church here yeah excavated in Capernaum and when they excavated below it they found the foundations of a much earlier house that probably dates to the time of Jesus and uh, inscriptions made graffiti actually kind of on the walls uh, later in the third four centuries actually record this as the house of Peter um, so early Christians are recording this as a holy place, and this really makes a connection between these early Christians and us. Um, when we go back to the Holy Land, it's because we want to see the places where the people we read about are walking and, and performing their ministries. Um, and this is really a way that Christians who are much closer in time to Jesus were trying to connect with him and with what they thought of as Peter's house here. And when you visit, when you come to this site, and it's, um, it's a high volume tourist area, when you come here, let, I mean, it may not be actually Peter's house, but it certainly illustrates it well. Uh, even though you have to think past this church built on top. I mean, that's what Christians did to uh, keep the memories of a place alive, build a church over it. Um, we're kind of disturbed by that. We wish they would have left that <laughs> stuff alone. Um, so that makes it a shrine. Now there's something else um, in this picture besides some other smaller buildings. Matt, what is this, um, this particular structure here? So we're looking at an early synagogue in that area. And I just want to say a couple things about synagogues at this time. As I mentioned before, this is a, a shift to thinking about a community center, um, perpetuating Jewish identity, maintaining who they are. But it also marks a shift in ideology. Now, the temple, when we think back in the temple period, it was only the priests who would go inside. At the synagogue, everyone goes inside. So we have a change there. Uh, in the temple period, the focus of attention is on the doors of the temple, uh, whereas in the synagogue, it's at the back wall. Yet, at the time, and, and think Daniel, where does he face when he prays? He faces towards Jerusalem, and the same thing might happen. So when they were first building these synagogues, they're actually orienting the doors, as you would a temple, towards Jerusalem. 
Now it was a little bit inconvenient because everyone would walk in and every time it was time to pray, everyone had to get up, turn around and pray. And eventually we can see, and this is something that archeology span shows us, this shift in ideologies where now the back door, the door is no longer the focus of attention. The temple has changed. The sacred structures are now totally uh, shifted in Jewish ideologies at the time, which is setting up that world of Jesus. Right. And the history of this shift uh, away from temple, especially right after Jesus, with the yeah. destruction of the, uh, yeah. of the temple in Jerusalem, right. the synagogue becomes, I mean, it's not a temple, but it is the central place of worship. Right. And so that ideology keeps shifting, and it's this background. Again, if one spends time with this literature from be between the Testaments, I mean, the, what, some, what Protestants would call the Apocrypha, um, especially the books of Maccabees. Um, there, are, there are four of them if you go far enough. Or, or what we call the Pseudepigrapha, just false writings it's called. They're just non-scriptural writings. When you read those and then you put together the kinds of material we get from rabbinic sources and then you put the, uh, with those the archaeological remains, we all of a sudden have been transported. I don't want to use, I don't want to use the language of, of Captain Picard, is that? <laughs> uh, you can tell I'm not one of those trekkers, okay? Um, but, but we are transported into that world. And all of a sudden then, when you sit down and read the story of Jesus going to the synagogue, synagogue in Capernaum, all of a sudden there's more life to that. It's not just black, black words on a white page. This is something very colorful. This brings it alive. And all of a sudden it's more memorable. Yeah. And for people especially who are used to hearing these stories, all of a sudden there's a new window of exploration. Absolutely. Okay, so back, uh, we're still at Capernaum. Um, yeah, this is just a reconstruction of what that original house um, from the time of Jesus would be like. So it's a little hard to imagine it from just the, the or architectural drawings that we saw. Um, but when you start reconstructing stone walls and mud brick walls, it gives you a bit better picture of the initial house at the core of this complex. Right, <clears throat> nicely reconstructed in this drawing here. Very mm -hmm. nicely done. Ah, something else um, archaeological from the time of Jesus. What is this? It looks like it's kind of a spiny creature. Uh, <laughs> what is it? Correct. This is the second really excellent archaeological illustration um, from Jesus' ministry in Galilee. Um, this is called the Galilee boat or the Jesus boat or the Canaret boat. Um, and it's a boat that was found... Um, in the 80s when there was a, a drought in the areas and the water in the Galilee was going down really low and it exposed this boat. Um, so through a series of exciting um, discussions and discoveries, they were able to excavate this boat that the mud had preserved and when they dated it, it actually dates to the time of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Hence the Jesus boat um, right. appellation being uh, tied to it. Um, but with some of the really great um, messages that this boat gives to us is when they studied the different kinds of wood that was used in its construction, they realized that this boat spanned at least a century. Um, and that it had been added to with different kinds of local timbers over time. The initial boat was constructed out of good old cedar of Lebanon. Um, so imported, nice new shiny boat. But over time, as, as you needed to replace pieces that were wearing out, they just did it with scraps of wood found locally. Um, so these people are, are working really hard to make something last. Um, they're not wealthy. Uh, they do live at the, at the poverty line, you know, one step away from, from that line. Um, and so they're working really hard to keep their boats in good condition um, until the day it finally sank where it was at. Right. A, a really important discovery. Um, uh, I've visited this several times over the course from it, uh, a couple years after the discovery. And the, the, the wood, we look at it now and it's fairly nicely shaped and firm, it was like wet cardboard when mm -hmm. it was excavated. Mm -hmm. um, and it was an interesting process actually to get it solidified. It's a kind of a waxy substance mm -hmm. that they soaked mm -hmm. it in. In any case, preserved, great to see, puts a little bit uh, more life uh, into the Jesus story or the disciples, the fishing stories. So, Okay, now we would be moving south to uh, Jerusalem. What do we see here? Uh, this is the first of the really great archaeological um, illustrations from Jesus' ministry in Jerusalem. And that's the focus that the Gospel stories put on the great temple of Herod itself. 
Um, so this is really the expansions that Herod made on the um, post-exilic temple, right. um, the elaborations, and these large stones that weighed up to 50 tons in places and could be 40 feet long at the foundations. And you right. can still see some of those today if you go on tours. Um, so think of the magnitude of this temple in the centrality of, of Jewish thinking. Do you have something you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, you know, you, when you're looking at this, of course, um, one of the interesting points, and we can relate it to what we're looking at uh, in front of us here, are those all the little mikvahs at the bottom. Yes, <clears throat> one can see a line of them here, and if we could, if it were light enough, we could see a line of them here. There were scores and scores yeah. and scores of these. And Doug, you mentioned earlier this idea of <laughs> ritual cleanliness, and you know, Samaritan right. women could spit, and and mm -hmm. you could cross that way. Right. Um, and of course, you know, we're thinking about this in this time as well, uh, the, the rabbinical laws that are coming in requiring ritual cleanliness to, to be able to approach the temple and some of these things that Jesus is fighting against. Yeah, yeah. yeah. very much a part of it. In fact, we could spend a lot of time. These um, s uh, steps coming up would be probably where Jesus would have entered into the temple complex. These stoa, these pillared or, or, uh, or pillared hallways, um, maybe this model of Jerusalem used to be at the Holy Land Hotel. I think they've moved it now nearer yeah. to, to the, the uh, Israel Museum. Museum. But these, uh, this is on a scale of 1 to 25. And mm -hmm. so you've got these long stoa, here, um, these pillars and so on, and then here would be the entrance to the Temple of Herod. Yeah. Ornate, spectacular, unmistakable, see for miles around. Oh, yeah. Um, and that would be the place to uh, go to worship. And here it is from that same angle. Here are the stoa, and then here would be the entrance into the temple, and then different sorts of, uh, of residential and other areas uh, around it. Mm -hmm. But I want us to think about this for a minute. What is this? These are um, from Jerusalem, from near the temple. What do these represent? The wealthy elite. Maybe the Sadducees, a house of a Sadducee, a house of, of any of the elite or nobles. Um, again, if you notice ritual cleanliness, we have a mikvah in the lower part of, of that house reconstructed there. Um, these people didn't have to go to the temple mikvahs. They could become clean here and then go to the temple. These people are rich. This is not Galilee anymore. Things have shifted quite a bit. Right. Now, there would be wealthy people in Galilee, but we're at the headquarters now. Yeah. And this. Uh, these, are, oh, they are, these are owned by the wealthy people, maybe mm -hmm. Sadducees. Maybe, yeah. Evidently, we're not all that anxious to fight against the Romans. I mean, they were doing well yeah. under the Romans. That says something about the tensions. I mean, we think about just reading the Gospels in a flat sort of way. Everybody kind of was thinking the same thing, or okay, you've got Pharisees and Sadducees. But archaeology has told us a lot about how intense some of these uh, differences were. And another uh, picture of inside as these were being excavated, including with some stone vessels. Mm -hmm. Stone does not absorb uncleanness yeah. ritually. Mm -hmm. And so what do we have right in front of us here? Well, this is another stone vessel. And as you said, um, it can't become ritually unclean. So as a Gentile, I could handle this. And if you were Jewish, you would still be able to wash your hands in here. That would be no problem. Um, another sign of the elites. Yes, the well-to-do, mm -hmm. made out of um, a, a soft kind of limestone, limestone something yeah. like that. Uh, we've got some other artifacts here. Monique, we've got a couple of very small ones here. What are these? <laughs> well, what we have here are some lamps from this period. So you have a Roman lamp, um, generally representing the Roman period here with fine decoration. Um, you see the blackening around the nozzle where um, a wick came out and burned the oil that was inside. Um, but this one in particular is the lamp that we think of from the time of Jesus, uh, right. from the Herodian period. Okay. Um, and when you think about the Ten Virgins story, this is the kind of small lamp that they were using. Thank you so much, Monique, and thank you, Matt. And thank all of you for joining us for this edition of Excavating the Bible. Until next time, think ancient, keep believing, and keep exploring. For Excavating the Bible, I'm Doug Clark.